Hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, my name is Lisa Wing. I am uh, the head of community at REF. And I'm here with Elito Badri. Uh, just a quick note, wanted to let everybody know that we'll be recording this session and it will be uploaded to our member research center after this call. Um, so today, Leo will be speaking to us about the power of celebration. We feel that this is uh, particularly relevant for this time of year, coming off Thanksgiving, coming into the holiday season. I'm a huge fan of celebrating, so I'm really excited to host this Expert Insight talk today. Uh, we have the amazing Leo joining us. Uh, just a little, back, little bit of background um, on Leo. Uh, so he's the founder and managing partner of Peer Innovation, which is an organization that offers programs and workshops that leverage group dynamics and, um, and strategic communications as well. He uh, has been with us in different talks, and we're so glad to have him on this one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, so his company has strategic communication to assist companies with building higher performing teams and helps CEOs with business leaders maximize their peer group experience. He's an award-winning author of three books, including Peer Innovation, What Peer Advisory Groups Can Teach Us About Building High Performance Teams. And he is also a keynote speaker a podcaster and a workshop facilitator, advisory board member, and opinion columnist for CEO, CEO World Magazine, and an adjunct professor for Rutgers University. Please welcome Leo. It's great to have you here. Let's get started. Lisa, thank you very much. It's such a pleasure to be here. And I think this is the second time uh, in 2022 that I've had the privilege of joining you all. So really excited. Um, just to be, you know, part of REF and what you're doing with Expert Insights. Um, as you suggested, the power of celebration, right? And what better time of year than to be talking about it now? We're, whether we're celebrating the holidays, uh, birthdays, I actually, my daughter's wedding is this weekend. Uh, you know, there's so many things going on, not to mention the milestones that we may be, you know, achieving when it comes to year end at work. And what's interesting about celebration is, by and large, at least when it comes to the big celebrations, we're pretty good at it, right? I mean, let's face it, we do a great job of celebrating birthdays, celebrating anniversaries. You know, when it comes to our sports teams, right? We're amazing. When our team wins, we are unbelievable, right? We, we The level of enthusiasm that we have, not only during the game, by the way, but when major sports teams win championships, they have celebrations in their city. There are parades where a million plus people will join, um, you know, when it comes to really looking at the accomplishment that their home team had and something they feel they accomplished together, right? Because you feel as a fan that you are as much a part of that experience and as much a part of the team, you know, as anything. Not to mention, of course, there's work. Um, there's a lot of big, tough things that we're asked to do at the office. And oftentimes, you know, those things aren't just a two-month project, a three-month project. Sometimes they're, they're a year long. Sometimes they're longer than that. And so what we're going to talk about today is the value and importance of celebrating not just those big wins, but those small wins, because it's my contention that the better we are at celebrating the small wins, the more big wins are going to come our way. And I want to get into that a little bit, and I want to share um, a story that's a, a bit of a metaphor for this. Um, I've got a good friend from the Netherlands, um, Alexander Keenan, who tells me that every time I speak, I should never um, omit a daughter story. Um, he's heard many of them, so I will share a daughter story right now, as a matter of fact. So where I want to go with this is a number of years ago, my daughters were in the mid-teens, and they said, Dad, we would love to climb a mountain peak. So the mountain peak you're looking at is Mount Baldy. It's just under 12,800 feet. There's about a 1,620 foot elevation gain. And, you know, um, not a small task to be able to get up here. Not considered a hugely difficult climb, but that's all relatively speaking, right? So anyway, they said, hey, we'd love to climb this mountain. I said, great. Here are the things you need to do to prepare. And then... In a couple of weeks, we'll go on a Saturday morning and we'll go really early because you have to leave about 6 a.m. Because oftentimes in Colorado, you get afternoon thunderstorms and the last place you want to be during a weather event like that is on top of a big rock, right? So sure enough, they do what they're supposed to do. 6 a.m. Saturday morning, we get started and we're off and running. 
all the enthusiasm you can imagine with this prospect of being at the summit and, and realizing the view, right? That they can only imagine in their minds at this point. So anyway, we start climbing, we're going for about an hour or so. And you can start feeling the little bit of exhaustion, right? And also if you've ever done this, what can tend to happen is you'll climb for a while and you'll look up at that peak and then you'll climb a little more and then you'll look up at that peak again and it seems like it's gotten no closer. So in addition to the physical demands of having to climb, as things get steeper and it gets higher altitude, now all of a sudden, <laughs> you know, um, you're in a situation where it becomes mentally exhausting because you're just not feeling like you're making any progress. So we get to a point in the climb where my oldest daughter says, um, hey, dad, I think the view looks pretty good from here. And I'm like, OK, and I'm starting to get a sense of where this is going. And then um, Taylor, uh, the younger one, says, hey, dad, there's a little puffy white cloud up there and near the peak. He said, is that weather? And we need to be concerned with that. And I'm saying, no, I think we're all right. So anyway, we climbed for a little bit more. And finally, they look at one another and they look at me and they said, dad, this has been great. And I know we were the ones that initiated this. But you know what? I think we're about done for today. Um, and I said, all right. I said, tell you what, do me a favor. Let's take uh, let's climb for 15 more minutes. And if we climb for 15 more minutes and you guys still are done, then no questions asked. We're off the mountain. I said, but what I want you to do first is let's take stock of where we are. So there's this rock and there's this big bush sticking out of the rock. And they really weren't quite understanding why I was pointing this out. But anyway, we climbed for our 15 minutes. As you might imagine, it gets 15 minutes to the second. And they're looking and said, all right, see, we're done. Um, and by the way, look, look at that peak. It's no closer than when we started. And I said, look behind you. All of a sudden now they look at that big bush that was coming out of the rock. And it was the tiniest dot in the landscape. And they looked at each other and said, oh, my God, wow, I can't believe, can't believe how much progress we've made. So the next thing you know, they're climbing another 10. We celebrate again. We climb another 15. We celebrate again. Those girls summited that day. And it was an incredible lesson for them and for all of us. In fact, both are leaders in their companies today. And they are constantly remind themselves of that day when they summited that peak, when they never thought, they could do it when it just seemed a little too far, when it just seemed they couldn't make any progress anymore, because they recognize that when they're leading projects on their teams, that if they can get people to reframe, if they can get people to appreciate how far we've come versus just be daunted by how far we still have to go, then we can make a difference in what we can accomplish together. I think this whole idea of keeping your eye on the prize is pretty bad advice in the scheme of things. Should we be um, aware of our goal? Should we have our goal in the back of our mind? Absolutely. But the bottom line is we really need to be acknowledging our progress. We need to develop a mindset where we're celebrating how far we've come versus how far we still have to go. And at that point, that can give us the fuel, right? So when we think about what celebrating does, right, because we're all used to it, we've all done it, what does it do, right? It actually boosts our morale. We, we feel better when we're accomplishing good things and we're really feeling positive, right? It strengthens our relationships with one another, which is really remarkable because the more cool things we do together that makes, uh, makes us feel great, you know, about one another and about what we're accomplishing. Most certainly improves engagement, right? The, when we're feeling uh, that positivity, it allows us to really dig in and be more engaged. Um, it puts focus where it belongs. You know, if you think about it, it's, if we're constantly focused on the goal, we're not focused always on what it takes to make that possible. I often think about this from a standpoint of, of playing poker, right? If you want your pile of chips to grow, you don't watch the chips. You pay attention to your cards. So I think when we start looking at it this way, we start imagining and really kind of diving into the process, being so concerned about the result. Um, it most certainly expresses appreciation, right? I almost feel like celebration and appreciation can be synonyms in many respects, right? It makes us feel good. It makes the people around us feel good and feel appreciated. Uh, and finally, I think it enables success. I think we will be more successful more often when we are not um, just constantly looking at, at what's ahead and we appreciate how far we've come. You know, so let's look at what the research says about this, as opposed to those things making intuitive sense. I want to talk about what the research says as well. 
Celebration increases oxytocin, dopamine, and endorphins, which also lower the stress hormone cortisol. Second, expressing gratitude improves relationships, which also relieves stress. I mean, if you think about the stresses that we have in our life, particularly at work, they're usually related to goals and they're related to the relationships we have. If we can do something that helps improve both, you know, how great is that? Next, celebrating workplace milestones promotes team member engagement and inspires employees to reach their full potential, you know, um, and there's real science behind this. Next, Celebrating progress places less focus on the larger goal and more focus on what it takes to actually achieve it. When leaders fail to recognize and appreciate their people, employees are 42% less likely to be engaged. There's an 18x increase in the probability of great work when employees are recognized, right? And then of course, 79% of people who quit their job claim it's due to a lack of appreciation. So when we're constantly asked to just come to work every day and it's just constant grind and constant getting hammered and we're not really taking time to figure out and celebrate, you know, how far we've come and what progress we're making and what we're, what we're actually doing together, it's not really um, the ideal conditions, right, for being successful over time. Now, for me in the work that I've been spending more than a decade doing, all of this bears out in a very big way. So in 2016, um, in, I, I co-authored a book with Leon Shapiro called The Power of Peers, and it's about how the company you keep drives leadership growth and success. And it's about what peer advisory groups do so well that helps them be so effective. Uh, in many respects, CEOs who are a support for one another, one of the things they do really well is they celebrate together. And, and it's really one of the few places they can do it. It's one of the few places they can do that dance in the end zone, if you will, and make them feel great about the things they're trying to accomplish, not only for their companies, but in their lives. And celebration becomes an enormous part of that. In 2018, I wrote a book called, called What Anyone Can Do that stepped outside of the arena of formal peer groups, but essentially looked at all the people who surround us in our lives, our kids, our parents, our teachers, our mentors, our mentees, our colleagues, and recognizing that, you know, um, we don't always do a great job of enlisting, engaging their support. So, of course, the book title comes from a line in a book written by Joe Henderson um, back in 1976. It was called The Long Run Solution. And in it, he was talking about very successful people. And he basically said, you know, look, most successful people, they're not capable of leaping tall buildings in a single bound. They don't, you know, perform superhuman feats all the time. In most cases, they just do the things that anyone can do, but most of us never will. So the contention in what anyone can do is if we can surround ourselves with the right people, they'll help us do those things that anyone can do far more often. And when we think about who we surround ourselves, we want people who will encourage us, who will maybe hold us accountable, who maybe have some technical expertise because maybe they've accomplished the same goal in their life or are looking to do the same thing. But the other important partner in that is a celebration partner someone who recognizes those key milestones that you're hitting along the way that gives you that fuel to keep going. All of this comes down um, and is filtered into peer innovation, which basically says, you know, what we do with our friends and family, what we do in formal peer groups, we take the best of the best in what we do in those practices, and it applies to high performing teams in an incredibly powerful way. And celebration becomes a really important part of that. Um, you know, when I think about one of the key findings when it came to what makes peer advisory groups really tick, what it is it that makes them so successful. Here was one of the key um, things that we identified. Any of the high performing groups we looked at anywhere around the world had what we um, identified as a learning achieving cycle, a robust learning achieving cycle. The idea is that when we're together, we learn better. Social learning theory has been teaching us this for decades. Um, you know, many times before I've mentioned Josh Burson's study back in 2019, where he looked at the fact that, you know, if we were, all of us were to read, a, let's say an 800 word blog post, and we were looking at it one time, we'd likely remember about 28% of it for about 24 to 48 hours. If we review it a second time, the number goes to 46%. If all of a sudden we started sharing that 
ideas and experiences and all with one another. Now the number goes to 69%. The thing about groups though is, and especially business groups, whether it's a CEO group or, or for key executives of, of any kind uh, in a company, um, it's not a book club. You're not just there to get content and discuss it with one another and learn it more deeply. What you also do is give one another the confidence, the courage, and the encouragement to apply things that you learn. And when you apply them, even if there's some trial and error, once you start achieving something that you've now added you know, in for yourself as a leader or for your organization, this is where you want to celebrate this. And by the way, celebration is the, is, has been added only this year to the learning achieving cycle. I always thought of celebrating as kind of a natural part of what happens when we achieve something, right? We celebrate. Um, unfortunately, the more workshops that I did among groups, the more workshops that I've done around teams, even the highest performing teams in, in many companies, we just don't celebrate enough. And the, again, the more we celebrate, the more that it provides that fuel for that learning, sharing, applying, achieving. Now, why does this matter? Well, it basically matters because the um, best teams, whether it's in business or in sports, um, actually don't regard winning championships or achieving a standard of excellence or reaching um, sharing a product as their goal. They actually see it as the reward for doing this really, really well. So you look at a, a, a team like University of Connecticut women's basketball team, for example, one of the more dominant programs in all of college sports, men or women, uh, 11 national titles, 14 consecutive um, final fours, just an unbelievable record over time in terms of what they're able to do. And this in large part has a lot to do with a team that celebrates a lot. You know, you think they're just celebrating national championships. They celebrate all the time. They're celebrating in practice. They're celebrating, you know, different plays in, in, in games and all of that. They're constantly reinforcing and, and providing one another the fuel and that positivity to do really, really well. And because of that, and because of the fact that they're not keeping their eye on the prize, they're keeping the eye on having an attention to detail every single day to try to be better today than they were yesterday to set themselves up to be better the next day. So come March when they're playing, um, you know, in the tournament and playing for a national championship, they've got a level of preparation that at least gives them the chance to win. Does it guarantee they're going to win all the time? Of course not. But they're always going to be in play. And I think it's really powerful. So think about it, right? Championships are not the goal. They are the reward for a daily commitment to excellence. I think that's true, again, for um, sports, and it's also true for business also. Next, I want to talk a little bit about some of my experiences. I um, owned my own PR firm for a while um, between actually 90, 1995 and 2000, um, and also worked for a terrific agency called Mullen Low in Boston. And one of the things that they were particularly good at, and I'd like to think that we were particularly good at at my firm, Batarian Partners as well, is making sure that we were celebrating small wins, making sure that we never missed an opportunity to celebrate. And I'll give you a great example of this. If any of you have ever been in that business, whether it's the advertising business, or you could be you know, submitting an RFP for a major assignment of sorts. You're trying to get hired um, by a client for a, a, some kind of huge project. Well, as you, many of you can probably you know, recollect if you participated in this many times, these projects take a lot of work and a lot of people and a lot of coordination. And, you know, sometimes these presentations that I was involved with could last three and four hours. And so I can remember on many occasions delivering that three or four hour presentation. And when we're done, it may be days, maybe a week or so before you find out if the client, um, you know, hired um, us or not. But the point isn't to wait until we find out what happened, because quite frankly, when you do that and you don't get hired, no one's going to be in the mood to celebrate. The real thing to celebrate is the work, because, by the way, you can give the greatest presentation in the whole world and you may get fired, hired, excuse me, for a whole host of reasons, not get hired for a whole host of reasons other than the quality of what you did. The quality of what you did could have been magnificent that you just never know what other factors come into play. So what you never want to do 
is lose that sense of people work really, really hard and they did something that was truly excellent. Um, there was a time in particular that I remember um, Joe Grimaldi, who is the former CEO of Mullen Lowe, when we delivered this presentation in New York, it was a four hour presentation. And after um, the session was over, he actually got a phone call and he was called away and we didn't see him. Quite frankly, we all flew back to Boston and that was that. And we got an email um, when we got home that night, which basically said, you know, you all did a fantastic job today. I got pulled away on a call that I really couldn't help. But I really, because of that, feel like I failed you in my role as chief encouragement officer. He said, tomorrow when we get in the office, we're going to make sure we celebrate the work. And because what we did together was was really remarkable. And we make sure that that doesn't get lost. And we did celebrate the work and it was extraordinary. And about three days later, we found out we actually won the business as well. And as Joe would tell you, you know, what's the big deal? We get to celebrate twice. How great is that? But to not lose those opportunities when we do really great work, how deflating that is when we're not celebrating the level of effort that our people are putting into uh, growing our business, right? Never miss an opportunity to celebrate the work. And that's, I think, the key message from that. So imagine how this applies, you know, for your own company and, and what that looks like for you. Next, I want to talk about um, what I'll call um, declaring victory. Um, this is kind of interesting in that um, a number of years ago, I used to uh, run quite a few marathons and um, loved it and really enjoyed it. And I would have these long run days from time to time that would be 20 mile runs. Now, every once in a while, you know, you have a day where you're just not feeling maybe as physically up to it as another day. And I'd get 18 miles in and all of a sudden I'm just spent. So I'd be walking and running kind of the last couple of miles just to kind of get me through it. And that was that. And I remember going through that exercise and I'd get to that point where I would run as far as I could and I would stop until when I just couldn't do it anymore. And then I'd walk for a while. And then when I felt up for it, I would run again for a while and just stop when I just couldn't do it any longer. And I remember explaining this to a fellow runner who said to me, you know, that happens to everybody. He said, don't don't sweat that. He said, but you're going about those last two miles all wrong. He says, what you need to do is pick a spot, run to it and declare victory. Um, and then I want you to pick another spot. I don't care if it's a stop sign, a tree, whatever it happens to be way out in the distance. You pick that spot, you run to it and you declare victory. He said the difference between the repeated failures and the, the number of kind of short term wins that you can get all along the way is not only going to help you go through those two miles more easily, uh, but it's going to give you more confidence next time around. Interestingly enough, my um, daughter, Kristen, was running a half marathon. And it was her first one. And um, she got to about that 11, 11 and a half mile mark. And she was really spent and really felt that she had to walk and run the end. And of course, I was kind of following her all along the race because the course allowed to be able to kind of duck in and out. And, you know, of course, I'm loath to kind of give her advice. She's exhausted. She's not really, you know, very happy about the fact of how she's feeling. So I didn't say I had advice for her. I just said, Kristen, I have an idea. In these last two miles, think about picking that spot. And I kind of explained how that worked. And she says, okay. And she does it. And it was really kind of fun at the end where she finishes the race, obviously very proud. Walk, run, doesn't matter. She completed the 13.1 miles, but also said, boy, was that last mile and a half easier when I went ahead and just, um, you know, kind of picked that spot and declared victory. And I think when we imagine ourselves, so for me, how this translates in terms of our work, is that think about those projects where you work until late at night and it's seven, 7.30, it's eight, maybe it's longer, later than that. And you're just working as long as you possibly can until you're just spent and you shut the laptop, you don't feel very good, you, you're going to bed and then you wake up the next morning and kind of hit you know, with the same big project in front of you. Think about the next time you're in that situation where you say to yourself, here's where I'm going to stop tonight. And when you get there, that's when you declare victory. And you say, now, okay, I got to where I needed to be. I can close the laptop. I'm going to sleep better. I'm going to go, you know, and get started on this and resume tomorrow, understanding exactly where I am. And this is going to be a process that I'm going to, um, you know, repeat over time. 
And again, I think it's very powerful and very helpful way to kind of reframe where we are, because at the end of the day, you know, just like my daughters, the first time when they climbed that mountain, it isn't they didn't have the physical ability to do it. They had the physical ability to do it. But, you know, mentally and emotionally, you know, we have to we have to treat that as well. And reframing can be a very powerful aspect of that and reframing in a way that helps us celebrate more, all the better. So let's talk about some celebration thought starters um, as we start thinking about it, because I really want you to think about this, not only the perspective of work, but even the perspective of your life. I mean, how many you know older people do you talk to that, you know, only now, you know, think, say, say to themselves, I wish I appreciated this more while I was, you know, experiencing it 20 years ago. I wish I, ex I appreciated my health. I wish I appreciated, you know, my family and friends and all that just a little more. Maybe we could have celebrated more together, not birthdays and anniversaries, but a typical Wednesday, a typical Thursday, <laughs> you know, a, a Monday when we're sitting around and and we can just acknowledge that, you know what, how great is this? How, how, how great is our lives? How great are, and, you know, no matter what's going on, and maybe you're going through a tough time, but the bottom line is that we can, when we can appreciate how far we've come versus how far we still have to go or appreciate what we have versus what we don't, um, I think it can just start making a huge difference for us. And obviously at the office, it's a big thing as well. Um, as a team, identify opportunities to celebrate progress. I would love it if you all got your team together and said, you know what, next year, as we think about these big goals that we have for ourselves, let's look at where and how we can take opportunity to celebrate, to recognize you know, our team, to recognize the great work we're doing. And by the way, it also represents a really good time to make some adjustments and tweaks along the way as well, right? Don't wait for the result to celebrate the work, as I mentioned with the example of whether it was my firm or at Mullen Low. Uh, when people do great work and you know that the work is great and that sometimes the result of whether you get hired or not is in the hands of someone else, that doesn't mean that you ever want to miss that opportunity for them to celebrate their work. Next, definitely declare victory by identifying short-term targets. And I hope you all can do this, not only as a team, but individually as well. I think you know, oftentimes we don't often personally just reflect and appreciate the fact that, you know what, here I am today, but you know what, six months ago or a year ago, I wasn't even close to doing what I'm doing right now. And to, you know, just to recognize that in yourself and to help others recognize it in themselves is a gift. Um, celebrate employee anniversaries as a team. Um, and one practice that I see peer advisory groups from all over do with great frequency is they'll be a member of a group and it's their anniversary. They've been to the group, doesn't matter, one year, five years, could be 10 years. And just to go around the table and have each person just take a few minutes to express their appreciation for the contribution that that person makes to the team and maybe to, makes to them personally. And it's an unbelievable gift for that person just to sit there for a few minutes and hear from their colleagues that level of appreciation for who they are and what they mean to them. And I think when we can provide as often as we can those forums, um, I think it's it's hugely and, and profoundly uh, you know positive influence on people. Um, celebrating birthdays and personal anniversaries, um, you know, as we know. When people come to work, um, they're not just workers, they're like whole people and they have lives. Um, and now sometimes I'll have people say, well, you know, we've got 50 people in my department. If we were celebrating every birthday all the time, we'd be having, you know, ongoing parties every single, you know, um, every single week. Um, and, the, and the point is, you don't always have to do that. Right. So let's say in February, or you've got four people over birthday. In March, you have another five people over birthday. Great. Pick one day where you celebrate the February birthdays, where you celebrate the March birthdays, where maybe, you know, in, in staff meetings, people feel free to talk about something that's going on in their life that they want to celebrate. Maybe it's a milestone that they've achieved. Maybe they've Maybe they've run a marathon, you know, and they want to let their, their coworkers know about it. Maybe they have a personal anniversary where, you know, maybe a milestone anniversary that they want to share. Um, 
And those kinds of things, again, create a, a sense of belonging and inclusiveness that can be hugely powerful when it comes to bringing people together. Um, most certainly take time to reflect on what you accomplished. Um, there's a practice that we often used at, um, when I was teaching at Seton Hall University uh, for our graduate students, where every Friday was just a weekly reflection. You know, it was on that Friday we'd think about what did I experience this week? What did I learn? How did I grow? And just a, a nice opportunity to kind of take stock of kind of how far you're, you're progressing and for something to do that every week. And you can set some, and you can use that to set some goals for next week. If you like, again, short-term goals were on the following week, when you have your personal reflection, it's okay to declare a little personal victory uh, around those things. And, you know, to, to treat ourselves a little bit, I think can be, you know, um, highly, highly recommended. Right. Um, I also want to just leave with, um, a, a note of happy holidays to everybody. This is an incredible time of year, I think, where, um, you know, we are at year end. You know, some of you are on different fiscal years, but at least in terms of calendar year end, we tend to kind of look, you know, toward the future. And, you know, for many of you, it may be about work and big goals and figuring out ways to celebrate. Uh, you may also have personal goals. You know, people often famously um, you know, have New Year's resolutions, right? Well, if you go about your New Year's resolution, the typical way people go about their New Year's resolutions, according to the University of Scranton, you'll have about a 92% failure rate on that. So if you're thinking about doing something for yourself and you actually want to accomplish that goal, then instead of just leaving it to your own devices, which typically, you know, doesn't always uh, work very well, um, that we enlist and engage the support of others. And we make sure that we have our people who can give us advice, who can, um, you know, provide us with the encouragement. And, and, you know, and I think very importantly, who can celebrate with us all throughout the year in terms of the progress we're making and how well we're doing. You know, as, if you go back to that metaphor of, of the girls on the mountain that day, the only way you get to the summit is one foot in front of the other. It's one step at a time. And, we can't cheat that process in, in most cases, but because it's a long process, because it can be a difficult one, we have to do something to keep ourselves and give us that mental strength to pursue um, you know, our goals and to press on. And I think when we do that, I think we can do some extraordinary things. So my message, I guess, this coming year, um, you know, we're already good at the big celebrations, keep doing that. And I think we'll have more of them if we really start focusing on celebrating ourselves and celebrating those small wins. So with that, Lisa, um, if there are folks have any questions, we'll let's let our balloons come up here. Um, I will stop sharing screen and we can kind of go from there. There we go. Lisa, you're muted. There we go. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you so much, Leo. That definitely resonated with me, um, not only at work, but at home. You know, I think it's always important. I love celebrating and I always try to find, um, you know, moments to uh, celebrate the the unusual sometimes, you know, just stepping mm -hmm. out of the box. Like, so sometimes I feel that even though there's these box celebrations, even like Valentine's Day, my friends always make fun of me because I'm like, you know what, just a little something little just to celebrate it who cares if it's forced upon you know so um yeah i'm definitely a, a big a big supporter of celebration um so we have a few questions in the chat um we have ruth and marley um mentions the comment she said could the term celebration sometimes be exchanged and expressed to your team around gratitude absolutely so Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's no question about that. that. That's kind of where I go with that, this idea of expressing appreciation and, and people feeling, you know, people feeling that and people really having a sense of gratitude for, again, how far they've come versus how far they still have to go. And I think that is really worthwhile. It's um, it's important. Again, you're not going to achieve any long term goal without having to do a whole lot ahead of time. And there's no reason we shouldn't be you know, celebrating all along the way. And when you talk about Valentine's Day, by the way, I think you know, 
I don't know why every day isn't Valentine's Day, right? And okay. and it doesn't have to be the the big celebration or whatever. But sometimes isn't it fun just on a on a Tuesday night when you're sitting around, you know, having you know a, a normal meal to throw a candle on the table, do something fun, do do something that you know um, you know says that to that other person that you're really special to me, and you're not just special because it's Valentine's Day. You're special because you're special to me every day um, throughout the year. And I think those kinds of things, especially when they're unexpected and especially when they're not on a particular holiday, I think can, can be, um, we really appreciate it. Yeah. I think it's probably easier to, um, you know, find these ideas when it's with people you feel comfortable with and they're a little closer, but what about celebration in uh, in the workplace? Like, why do you believe that celebration is not practiced enough in most workplace cultures? Largely because it's just go, go, go. Everyone's all about what's next. We got to hit our numbers. We got to hit our goal. And we get so caught up, you know, in that, that we don't recognize that how celebrating isn't a distraction from achieving your goals. It's actually a necessary part of making that possible. And I think once we embrace that idea, we'll learn to celebrate more. But it starts with identifying what those opportunities are to celebrate. Where do we do it, you know, in, in a way that provides people that fuel, right? So, um, so I think it doesn't happen, again, often enough because we're just getting caught up in, you know, we're, quote, too busy, you know, um, when, in fact, I think we'd be wise to make time for those things because at the end of the day, you know, if we actually want to achieve what we want and, and we want to do it with the people, that we started with, right? We want to make sure that people feel that sense of belonging, that they feel that level of engagement and excitement and sense of purpose about what we're doing. It's not just always about hitting the goal. Um, and so we, we've got to work at that. You know, that's not something that, um, you know, we, we can just not pay attention to. Right. Yeah. So we have another question from Alfredo de la Guardia. And he asked, what do you recommend when celebrating birthdays once a month becomes routinary, like very common? Like what can we do to mix it up? I, I suppose you could mix up how you how you celebrate it. And also, by the way, I would put, um, you know, different in, people in charge of, of organizing those parties because they'll come up with different ideas about how to do it. And it could be very simple. It could be something that's done over over a lunch hour or something that's done during a break or or part of your you know, meeting where you've got people gathering already, you can have some efficiencies around how you do that. But I think you can keep them fresh by trying to tap into the talent. You have the collective intelligence, right? A lot of collective intelligence in, uh, on our teams. So let's tap into some ideas they have to keep those celebrations fresh. Uh, even if they're every single month, they're celebrating different people's birthdays. There could be fun ways to do it. Maybe there's a theme you know, that aligns with that month really well or whatever it may happen to be. But I think um, your people will come up with some really innovative, cool things to do. Yeah, that's a great idea. Asking others for ideas as well, because I think that that was one of my questions as well. When you had mentioned these presentations you had and how you went back to Boston and you celebrated, like I just wanted to get some other ideas on on maybe something unique that everybody can take to their workplace. It is a little bit out of the box and, you know, getting stepping out of that routine that Alfredo mentions. Any other ideas on on what specific type of or like exercises or or some sort of gatherings that are a little unique that come to mind? No, you know, I think that you have to celebrate in a way that feels authentic to the people participating, right? It's not about being forced into a situation that feels fake or feels contrived or something like that, that which is why um, I think having whatever you're going to do come from your folks and be reflective of who you are and what your culture is all about so that it feels, you know, authentic to you is probably, you know, the best thing of all. But, you know, the, the, the simple things like we talked about, which can be, you know, just, um, you know, as simple as a, an employee anniversary where you just go around the table and everybody expresses their personal appreciation for the fact that that person is on the team and in their lives, you know, that's powerful stuff. And that's, and that's really simple to do. 
Yeah. And I also like what you mentioned about, um, you know, celebrating like the small wins or looking back and sharing milestones or, you know, you said how sometimes you come to work and you forget that they're people, you know, they have their problems at home and they have their families. And so they're going, they have their personal side too. So I know sometimes it can be a little uncomfortable bringing like the personal side to work, but I think if you do it in a fun way, you know, always, I think that you know, the power of, of games, I think, is the power of a celebration, too, because you're just kind of putting a little lightness into um, maybe a topic that's a little, you know, it's very important because you're, you you know, celebrating the wins, but you can do it in a, in a fun way, which always helps, I think. To bring well, together. the pandemic made that more of a blended experience than ever, right? Because when we were taken out of a central workforce and all of a sudden now you're basically being invited into everybody's home, that that changed the game. Right. Um, there were kids and dogs and all kinds of craziness going on. You had people who were, in addition to all trying to work together to get the actual work done, um, there were challenges that people had. Maybe they were, you know, concerned about elderly parents. Maybe they were trying to homeschool their kids. Maybe there were all kinds of things. And I think in many respects, there was a great irony to how people became closer together when you actually pulled them out of a central office, at least for a while. Um, and I think it was rather remarkable how more leaders and many who told me that they, um, instead of beginning their meetings with, okay, where are we? How are we doing? What's going on here? would say, how are, how are you doing today? And you go around the room and you spend that few minutes again, you know, not something that takes away from the meeting. When you consider the totality of what you were going to accomplish at the meeting, taking that few minutes to just meet people where they are and, and ask and care enough about them um, is, is, is really powerful. And so I think people got a, just came at, you know, they just kind of tapped into their shared humanity a little bit. They were just a little bit more cooperative and a little more collaborative and understanding of one another and seeing the best in each other and recognizing that we all had these shared challenges in many respects. And I think it did a lot to bring teams together. And, and um, I think even if we're coming back to a central workplace or if it remains hybrid or whatever that happens to be, the lesson from that is something that we should be really intentional about. And I think weaving celebration in, in any way we can into that equation will help advance that as well. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so I have one last question. Um, do you believe um, some leaders see celebration as a distraction rather than a benefit? What would you say to those leaders that, that feel that, that it's more of a distraction <laughs> than a benefit? Um, I, you know, I, I literally would tell them the, um, the, the Kristen and Taylor story about going up the mountain, because I think the metaphor is is it's not just, a, you know, a, a fun story. It's not it is absolutely relevant. You know, when you think about those big long term goals and we think about climbing peaks and think about, you know, how that is used. Right. Getting to the top of the mountain, you know, is kind of this whole thing. Well, getting to the top of the mountain is great, you know, but no one's going to helicopter you up there. You actually have to do the work to get up there. And even if you're physically able to do it, um, it, it is it is that's not your big challenge, your big challenge. And, and let's face it. And I, and I think rightly so. And this plays into the whole mental health conversation that is coming up about today's workplaces. Also, we need to really be thinking about how do we, you know, give people the emotional support necessary to do big things. And so yeah, and I think celebration plays a huge part in that. I think celebration, appreciation, what Ruth Ann mentioned regarding gratitude and, and having that be part of what's kind of operationalized in the way people work together, I, I think is enormously helpful. So, you know, um, and, and I think for a lot of companies who aren't always hitting those big goals all the time, you know, um, you may be able to say, well, um, here's something new for you to try. And here's something that you can do that will keep your people excited and engaged. And it's enthusiastic when you get three quarters into the project as you were when you got started. And I think that's going to be important in getting things done. Right. As, as you said, you know, not only, um, you know, keeping your eye on the prize, but acknowledging the progress. <laughs> 
Yeah. And so one, one of our um, participants says, made me remember the Al Pacino speech. It's all about inches. <laughs> Love that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I think that that's pretty much it, um, Leo. We got the questions in. Um, I feel that you, you know, I, I had a few questions you covered within your now, you know, within your answers. So I don't know if, if you want to have a closing statement. Um, you know, I think that the takeaways are, are pretty clear, at least for me. But um, you know, wanted to thank you for this insightful and very timely um, expert insight. And we'll definitely look out for your um, your books and your speeches. And, you know, hopefully you can keep on collaborating with us and, you know, always have um, that idea of, you know, as you mentioned, not, not only keeping your eye on the prize, but acknowledging the, the progress, the, the inches, the, the baby steps. So um, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for everybody who called in today. And, um, you know, we're open to questions and comments if you want to reach out to us and we'll be recording the session and putting it um, on our site as well. So that'll be it for today. Thank you, Leo. Any closing statements? Yeah, um, thank you for that. Um, I really would think about putting your team together and talking about how you can identify those short term wins and how you can integrate that into how you work. You'll be thinking about things that you're looking to accomplish together um, next year. And you recognize that some of these projects are, are not short term, they're longer term. And they take that daily commitment, which is always not easy to sustain, right, over time. And, uh, you know, I think that the better that the team can come up with ways and ideas for not only identifying opportunities for those small wins, but then how to celebrate those together in a way that feels authentic uh, and inspiring to to the team itself, I think is a really worthwhile conversation. No better time to have it than in this you know period of celebration. And I just really wish everyone you know a wonderful, happy holiday season and a terrific 2023. Thank you so much, Leo. It was great speaking with you today. Invite everybody else. Thank you for joining in. You too. Thanks. <laughs> Goodbye.